Good morning, friends of Oak Island. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are on the planet, as I usually say. Welcome back to the channel for a new video today called Cabbage and Genealogy, which is kind of odd in the context of treasure hunting. Uh, a couple of words before I start. I haven't been, haven't been producing many videos lately uh, due to my personal life. Things have changed and professional life. Started a company two and a half years ago here in France and it's doing great at the moment. So it's really taking a lot of my, of my life uh, making this startup work. So these are good news, but uh, I didn't have that much time to spend on the Oak Island topic. But since the season is starting again with the season nine, giving me ideas and motivation to start again. So for our own enjoyment, this is cabbage and genealogy. Why cabbage? I was watching the replay of John Stammer's show, uh, Quest of Oak Island, and there was a discussion about how come uh, Samuel Bull was able to grow cabbage on an island that didn't have fresh water. And that was a very interesting question. And the question I asked myself a couple of months ago while studying another problem I had. Um, so this is um, some kind of the answers to this. And uh, we'll see about the genealogy because when I start looking for Samuel's Bull's life, I realized there's something we kind of miss is the occupancy of the island at the moment the money pit was discovered. And some things don't clink. So let's have a look together. By the way, uh, on behalf of Michael, dot to dot, uh, which I had on the phone a couple of days ago, uh, I wish to say hello on his behalf. Everything's fine, he's also working. Also on the theory is deep diving into some documents like crazy. And I hope soon you'll be producing a video with his findings. But let's start with a cabbage and genealogy. Uh, of course, uh, I want to use the fair use on YouTube. I'm going to use material that uh, don't own, but uh, I'm not making money out of it. And this is for the research purpose. Therefore, I think it's allowed by the fairness rule of YouTube and of the uh, US law. Okay, let's start. I got from a website that I'm quoting at the bottom some information about the island occupancy in 1795 where, when supposedly the money pit was discovered. Why supposedly? Because after doing this research, I personally now have doubts about the year. But we'll talk about this during our presentation. In 1795, these were all the lots and their owners on Oak Island. And we can see Daniel McInnes was owning some lots and we have the McInnes Foundation on lot 23, which are represented by a house. That's where they used to live. We have the Vaughan clown. The Vaughan clown was living on the island. Uh, and I'll, I'll deep dive into who they were and um, particularities about this family. Samuel Bowles is in red and used to own a, long, uh, a lot of land. He bought some land originally and then was granted extra lots by the government from the fact uh, he was participant in the uh, uh, independence war of uh, the US. We have um, people we don't hear that name very often, the Macmillan clan and John Smith, one of the three supposedly uh, discoverer was Part of this family though the last name doesn't match we'll see that again we have somebody called nathaniel melvin that we don't hear much and i really don't know what happened to their lot it's not explained in the different sources i explored and john smith um, owned a piece of lot himself on the land and guess what it was lot 18th where the money pit was and that's where his house was also We'll get back to that because that's very strange. Edward James uh, was owning Lot 20. Edward James was a paid officer with extensive service to the King's Navy and the King's Orange Ranger during the Revolution. He commanded troops in Liverpool. And he married a daughter of Philip Knott, who was the most powerful politician in all Lunenburg County. So that person was quite high in the establishment around Lunenburg. What's first thing we can notice is the story that the island was inhabited and three boys, teenager, took a skiff to row across the channel and explore that inhabited island 
is wrong, wrong, and wrong again. Uh, we'll see later that they were not teenagers, only two of them were, but Daniel was in his 36, 37, and, and they didn't cross uh, the channel to an inhabited Oak Island. Everybody was living on the island. Everybody knew everybody. And guess what? Even people married across uh, the island. They were um, neighbor marriage. And uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> we have Ambrose Al Allen, 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 Ambrose Allen here. I'm going to circle him. I'm talking about this character here. So Ambrose, um, his first wife passed away, died, and he married as a second marriage, Mary Compton Vaughan, who was nobody but the daughter of, if I'm not wrong, John Smith, but I will detail that later. I think it's John's, uh, uh, John's daughter. So like 25, like, like, like it's, they were 25 eight years apart from the male and the female in that couple. And so that was interesting that he ended up marrying the daughter of Smith or Mullen. I, I'll, I'll check it. We get another slide for this. Um, interesting, the Vaughan family, and I'll get back to that again, there are several members of the family living on the island. So you can see there was a lot of people living on the island in 1795, or at least owning lots. But established was four families or four houses Samuel Bull had his house on lot 25. Daniel McInnes had his lot on 23. Uh, Neil McMullen, who married Margaret Smith, who was born McLean and was the mother of John Smith. Uh, she, they lived on lot 11, probably where Fred Nolan's house was in that area at the end of the swamp. And very strange, and I'll get back to this, John Smith bought lot 18 from Casper Wollenhaupt on the 26th June, 1795. I don't have the month at which the money pit was discovered. Was the lot bought right after by John Smith, who understood there was something to own there that was valuable? Um, and what's very peculiar, he built his house a couple of yards away from the money pit itself. I wouldn't build my house next to a money pit in case my house would get sink into the money pit. But we, we, again, we'll investigate that. Very interesting already. A lot of people living or coming or being acquainted to the island. And Samuel Ball had a lot of land and was already on the island at the time. Interesting. Let's do, OK. And that's what I was saying, that, that's strange. Sight of, so th this is um, uh, Fred Nolan's survey. This is Fred Nolan's map. And he identifies the uh, uh, stone triangle here, the, what, what he thinks is the money pit there at this location. And the site of Smith Homestead 1804, nine years after the discovery of the money pit, if it was indeed in 1795. And the house is really next door to the money pit. So there's something I don't understand there. Um, maybe my English not good. Homestead, I think Homestead is the foundation of the house, and that's where their house is. But so close to the money pit, that's that's something I don't understand. So let's have a look at the Vaughan family, Vaughan of Vaughan. And we had two brothers, Daniel Vaughan and Anthony Vaughan Sr., who've been living on the island for a while. And if I go here about their, the way I understand their genealogy, so we have Daniel and Anthony Vaughan were brothers and were owning lots uh, five for one and 15 and 16 for the other. Anthony Vaughan Sr. had a son named Anthony Vaughan and that's this Anthony Vaughan that was part of the original discoverer, friend of Smith and Daniel McInnes. And I was right, he had a daughter named Mary and Mary eventually married Albros Allen, must have been much older than her, since she was the daughter of uh, Anthony, and Anthony was uh, 16, from what I remember, at the uh, time of discovery of the money pit. So maybe he got his first daughter at the age of 20, waiting 20 more years for her to be 20, and marrying Albro Albros Allen, who already at, in 1794, 
lot. So there was quite a difference of age between the two. And I find it very interesting, not to say peculiar, that he married her neighbor's daughter when she was on age to be married, and it was uh, quite old already. But that's the Anthony Vaughn we're talking about. That's the person that supposedly Daniel went to um, um, discover the money pit with. And of course, they knew each other since they were all living on the same island. Uh, Daniel was in the 36, 37 at the, in 1795, according to his uh, birth certificate. And the Vaughn uh, son was only 16, so probably a couple of youngsters living there. Uh, Anthony Vaughn was one of them. John Smith was another one. Uh, and they lived on the island after their teenagehood, but they knew Daniel and the McInnes family um, for quite some time already being on the island. It's not a big island. You know your neighbors here. So that's the Vaughn people, family, and a lot of Vaughn living on the island. This is the Macmillan uh, lot, three lots. So Neil Macmillan was married to Margaret Smith, the mother of John Smith. From what I understand, uh, John was already alive, born, when uh, Neil married Margaret, but I'm not 100% sure. I think he is. Uh, he was 13 at the time of the marriage, from what I understand, uh, reading. And their house was uh, located at the tip of, Nolan's, of the uh, swamp triangle, probably where Nolan's house uh, was. Very interesting. Let's carry on. The McInnes. Oh, the McInnes. When I, when I started to deep dive into their family and, um, and, and the ancestry, lots of things to discover. So this is the McInnes lineage we're talking about. The Daniel McInnes, one of the first discoverers, uh, was not born under this name. He was born under Donald McInnes, and probably with a K, McInnes written like this. And what happened is described in the McInnes family book that I read, and I will uh, show you the cover so you can get it if you wish. It's a quite interesting book in our context. When he got married to Barbara Mary Solar, the priest um, changed his name and changed Barbara Mary's name as well. He reverted the two first names, and Barbara Mary was now called Mary by everybody and was remembered as Mary McInnes. Very interesting because later in the book that of the of, of the family they're talking about a Mary McInnes and I thought Mary McInnes was here, was at that level. But no, we, we're talking about Barbara Mary who became Mary Barbara, and Donald McInnes became Daniel McInnes by the huh, by the, the 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 magic spell of a priest who married them. But this is not unheard of. I've heard many stories in France that the people. Uh, were, getting to, were to get married at this time in the Middle Age and later, didn't know how to write. And only priests and uh, the, the likes could write and read. And they were asked, what's your name? And they would verbally say their name. And whatever the priest wanted to imprint was what was going to be left for eternity in the administration, the future administration of the country. So that, that's how they got their name changed quite some often back in the days. So Donald becomes Daniel, and he marries a Barbara that becomes Mary. Already a mystery in this treasure. Now they have uh, <clears throat> at least five children that are uh, identified. Uh, John being the first boy, Catherine, Mary, Henry, and Daniel McInnes. Again, as often, you would name your son as the father. So it would be Daniel Jr., I guess, was the second son. Um, he himself... Uh, was married and had children, and uh, his child was named George, one of the child. I don't have the full list of the, uh, I don't have the, the name of the wife of Daniel McInnes' second son, and I don't have all these kids, but one of them was George, George William, that everybody called Bill, because there was a lot of Georges in the McInnes family, obviously, and he married a Rhonda Hilt. Later, he would be referred as Grandpa Bill, and he, he will reveal some information for us that's very interesting. Daniel McInnes was just his grandfather, right? And um, he, as a grandfather, had somebody named Jim McInnes. That will be very interesting for us. So George William Bill, Grandpa Bill, marries Rhoda Hiltz. And they have several children, and one of them is called Ambrose McInnes. Ambrose marries Esther Elizabeth. And they have four children. 
three daughters, Jean, Joan, Joyce, and one boy, James. James, nicknamed Jim McInnes. This is a picture of Jim McInnes. I got coupled, but I don't want to reveal the whole book. It's not necessary. Uh, spent his life in, uh, went to Vietnam and uh, uh, was looking for the treasure and uh, had this cross on him. This golden cross has appeared in Curse of Oak Island. I can't remember the season and the episodes where the girls, Jean, Joan, and Joyce, <clears throat> go on the island and meet Rick and explain their family ancestry and the fact that this cross Jim had was given to him by his father, was given by his father and his father, and was discovered, according to the family legend, by Daniel in the money pit. And from reading the book of the McInnes family, you realize this cross is extremely important to them, and they really, uh, they really think the solution, uh, part of the clue, is there. I measure this cross, uh, and the ratio of length to width is kind of similar to Nolan's cross, but at the end of the day, most Catholic cross have similar ratios, so I don't think it's conclusive, but at least it's not out of scope, and it, uh, it could be linked. According to Jim... His great-grandfather, Daniel, was, is buried on the island, on Oak Island, but I don't think I've seen any graveyard or anything like a grave uh, from anybody on Oak Island, so I don't know how true this is. All right, interesting, the McInnes family. First, the name change, and then we have Jim, and we'll see Jim again reappear. This is the book I'm talking about, and as fair use, I'm only taking bits and pieces that are of interest for our quest, but this is a small book, um, 100 pages, probably very cheap. You should get it. It tells you very interesting stories from the inner family. I won't reveal more, of course, to respect the authors. But a couple of excerpts. Going back to La Formule. This is, I think, uh, Jean or Joanne, one of the girls who wrote the book. They wrote three-handed book. This is what she said, and this is very interesting. I'm attaching a piece of paper that Uncle George that's, um, uh, showed me. Uh, I'm not sure it's Grandpa Bill. That must be one of his brother. One, so we are, at, we are at this level of the family, right? It's the uncle of Jean or the uncle of Joan, so it's one of the brothers of Ambrose. One time he pointed to the page and said, this is just one piece of the puzzle. We're talking about this here. And we know that piece of puzzle. And it was kept hidden behind a wall, behind a stall in the wall of Daniel's cabin. So they're saying that Daniel already had his hand at one point in time, that document. He said, the more you discover on Oak Island, the more you will need to find the rest of the pieces of paper. Indeed, we got that from the scrolls of Ontario. We know how many they are. We know what they are. Somebody photographed them photograph the other side, not this side, as we demonstrated in some of our videos earlier. I do not know where the inscription was copied from, and I have no idea what the symbol means. We now do. I'm sure you are wondering why I did not ask him any question, but the truth, I thought he was crazy. Blah, 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 blah. So that's very interesting that uh, uh, this piece of parchment or document or at least the copy of it is claimed to be in the McInnes family as long as Daniel and the discovery of the money pit. Very interesting. And what, what John says, or which, I don't know which one of the girls, this is a copy of the one Jim, Jim here, our Jim McInnes, had in his personal belonging that Joan kept safe. Jim's copy, which I will prove you, is not the copy of Daniel that I had hidden behind the wall, and it is not the copy that Uncle Joel showed. It is not. I, I explain you that in a second. Jim's copy has notes in French. What is it? It's Lam the Mary's note about that poor person who passed away at the age of blah, 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 blah at the bottom of this. They were written at the bottom of the page. So Jim's copy has got the Marie's note. Okay. Jim's copy has got the Marie's note. 
here. According to Don Drew in the Schools of Antera, this is the version that Bill Jackson, our dear researcher, obtained from Jim McInnes with the signature Jim McInnes to W.D. Jackson and the set. This version here that you're seeing cannot exist before 1925. Why am I claiming this? Because this sentence, le vent se lève, il faut tenter de vivre avec le cimetière marin, is the first sentence of the last verse of that great poem author, Paul Valerys. And the name of the poem is the Marine Cemetery, the Marine Graveyard. And that's the first sentence of the last paragraph. That was written in 1925. So Daniel McInnes, his copy, he cannot possibly have the text French. That Jim McInnes has it, meaning somebody had it or he had another copy from another source, but the copy of Daniel McInnes cannot possibly have this sentence, therefore the French text on it. Impossible. So what do we conclude from this? Is that Daniel had a version, which was a copy of the upper part, and Jim had a version which had the French text on top of it. Daniel cannot have the French text because the French text cannot have been written after 1925. And Daniel is from 1795. And on this copy, this version is actually not Jim's version. It's Bill Jackson's version because this was added by Jim McInnes. So we have three copies. The original from Daniel doesn't have any text. The version from Jim, of course, doesn't have this signature and has this. And the version from Bill Jackson had everything, the three of them. The question is, who added this part? When? After 1925 for sure. And why? And we know it contains here, cryptid, a distance or scale that we use on the La Rochefoucauld map, Zina Halpern's map. Totally linked, no doubt. So I'm not solving mysteries here, I'm putting more questions on the table, is why do we have three copies? I understand the copy from Jim to uh, David Jackson is just adding the signature. And I'm wondering sometimes if the signature is not something hidden. But why does it that from Daniel, who I think he discovered it on his progression down the money pit, he only had the La Formule cryptid part, and it is absolutely chronologically impossible he had this part. And it's talking about, you know, 17... Uh, 78, 1978, sorry, so it's kind of modern. Uh, the French is modern French, so this was added later for sure. But I don't know why and by whom, but there are people involved there, definitely. Let's move on. <clears throat> Samuel Ball. I didn't think I would find that many things about Samuel Ball when I started my search a couple of days ago on this. So from the 1791 census, Samuel Bull's neighbor included Don McInnes, John Munro, which I couldn't find a trace as a lot owner, Neil McMillan, who married Mrs. Smith, uh, mother of uh, John Smith, Don McInnes, who, like Samuel Bull, is a refugee from American Revolution War. Now, all these people on the island I found were connected by the American Revolutionary War. They all served for the British part. Interesting. There are no direct contemporary account for treasure being sold on Oakland. That's very important. There is nothing from 1795 that tells us what happened. The first record happened 60 years later. 60 years. So the 1975 date is not a 100% sure date. Nobody in 1795 said this is what happened. And the fact that we found that, um, uh, what's his name, Vaughn, that bought his house, uh, was it? No, Smith. Smith bought a house in, so he was, what, 16 or 17 years old, which is, which is adult at the time, um, bought a house right next to the money pit in 1795. All that is strange. <clears throat> the most telling story playing place, yeah, the most common tellings of the story Place the event in summer, 
summer, exactly when he bought the land. That's very strange. Three youth, which is we know it's not true now. Depression, fix the branch. These youth were almost account Daniel McInnes, John Smith, and Anthony, Anthony Vaughan. Yet, some tellings place Samuel Ball as the third participant and not Vaughan. Other more recent examples even state that all four were present. Now, wait a minute. They are all living on the island. They all knew each other from living on the island. Everybody knew about Samuel Ball, who was growing cabbage. Everybody knew about Daniel McInnes, who was uh, um, kind of a, he was a minute man before the English. Um, so it's not a minute man. It's a regular fourth guy. Everybody know uh, the Vaughn brother. Everybody know everybody in this little community. And John Smith, in June, is, is the 26th June summer? Yeah, it starts on the 22nd or 21st, so you can say in June. Just bought this land, and a couple of weeks later, they found our Daniel finds the money pit, not by hanging in the wood on a deserted island after watching firecrackers the night before. They, those guys been there. So what I don't have is the date at which the house was built, 1804, according to Fred Nolan's survey, 1804. So he bought the land and he built his house after they started excavated the money pit first time. Because then, remember, they stopped and they had to wait for 1806, I think, after the house is built, obviously, to restart and then start the craziness about the money pit. Some things are strange in this story compared to the admitted version and the re re reader digest version. This, this is hard fact based on uh, census and uh, administrative records and date of birth and date of death. And yeah, interesting. So yeah, that's, that's the thing with La Formule. So I think there are three versions of La Formule. Samuel Ball, yeah, okay, Samuel Ball. It keeps likely that Samuel was acquainted last to the founder of Money Pit, struck a friendship, Vaughn family. He had lot four, five, Vaughn was a neighbor to Ball. He purchased land from the family. And Anthony Vaughn, we don't know if it's senior or junior, we don't know if it's the father of the son, but I think it's the youngster, is one of the executor of the will. I mean, good neighbors, huh? They knew each other to the point that they would marry the daughter of the guy next door. One would be the executor of the testament of the other. Ball was one of the first people summoned by Daniel McInnes upon the discovery of the money pit, according to the history of Lindenburg Country, which is the oldest record of what happened. Uh, 1856. They knew each other, I think. McInnes was in Shelburne at the same time was Ball purchasing a lot in the town, and then moving to Chester, where Samuel Ball would also relocate. They're living in Shelburne. Now, one moves to Chester, the second moves. Now, one moves to Oak Island, the second follows. Yeah, they probably know each other from Shelburne, Chester, and now Oak Island. It's pretty strange, huh? I don't think we got a count on this. The popular version of the events, come on, no, romantic ideal. McInnes was aged 36, 37, according to the birth certificate. John Smith, 19, sorry, not 16, 19. So in the age of founding a family, buying a house, he was born in 1775. And Vaughn was the youngster, around 16. Ball must have been around during the discovery. I don't know if what I'm saying is politically correct, but Ball being a black man, was he forgotten from the history book because at the time... It was not thought that a black man could discover a treasure and it was white man's business. I don't know. Let's carry on. Let's carry on to growing cabbage. So, during one of the last shows of John Stanner, uh, was the question about, well, if Samuel Bull was growing cabbage, where did he find the water to? So, first question, how much water do you need to grow cabbage? You see, when you look for treasure in Oak Island, you end up learning tons of things you would never think about learning before. And how much water to... Water cabbage is one of them. One to one and a half weeks of water in the soil once a week. I mean, he had a couple of lots with cabbage. That's quite some water. And water doesn't like soggy soil. It doesn't like the swamp in its dry land, it's wet or dry land. Well, wet, it doesn't tolerate sitting in wetland, so dry or moist. So that's one thing about water consumption from cabbage. The other thing is 
The island was not deserted, and it was only Samuel Bowles. There were seven families, I counted. Maybe not living full-time, but let's imagine three liters to drink per head, plus three liters per day for cleanliness and other needs. That's six liters per day per person. Seven families, I'm betting on 20 plus inhabitants. So roughly, if I multiply, 60 to 80 liters per day are necessary for having those people survive. And the cattle, we know Samuel Bull had uh, some cattle that he, um, uh, that, that he gave away were on his testament, They're, it's documented. And other people were farmer, they had cattle, horses, you name it, cows, oxes. So I'm thinking at least 53 gallons a day and there's no road. So either you go get your 53 gallons every day by skiff rowing across the bay, or there's a source of fresh water in this island somewhere that we lost. I'm sure that now the water tap at uh, Reeks and Marty's uh, warehouse is tap water that was brought with the causeway. But at the time, they needed water to live, to feed the uh, uh, cattle, but, and I didn't even account for that 1.5 inches of water on the surface of the island. So there must have been fresh water. Okay, of course, we know there's fresh water on the island. There's tunnels and there's a system underground. But check this out. On the same book that I'm talking about uh, from the uh, McInnes family, listen to this. She, it's a discussion between Esther Elizabeth McInnes, talking to her daughter, I think it's John, but it could be one of the three daughters. It's Esther relating something to the daughters. Esther looked at the ocean and said she remembered Grandpa Bill, her father, grandson of Daniel. She remembered Grandpa Bill saying when Daniel and Mary, Mary being Barbara, Mary, you became Mary Barbara, huh? that's, that's here. That's Mary moved there, there was a large, fresh water hole with a dam. So they had fresh water, there was a hole with fresh water, and there was a dam that was keeping this water where it was. He said it is due east of the cabin along the North Shore branch, and she pointed in the direction we were heading. This was starting to make sense, John, Joyce, or Jane says, because when it does not run on my island, she lives on an island, we can buy water, but I could not think of a reason why anyone would start a family, seven families, on an island with no fresh water source in summer month. Of course, you wouldn't survive there. So Grandpa Bill says that at the time of his grandfather, there was on the island fresh water hole and a dam, so that was man-made, and it was due east of the cabin where they lived, North Shore Beach. Let's have a look. This is La Roche-Foucault map, as you know it. And here we have their cabin. I relocated it more or less what it is on the map. This is North, South, East, West system. And if I go due east to the shore, what do I find? I find Le Bassin, the pool or the hole of water and the barrage, the dam. There was a large, fresh water hole with a dam. Large, fresh water hole with a dam. Which doesn't exist anymore. Which doesn't appear in any photography. We've got aerial photography of the island. And I checked back in the 30s, 20s. No such thing as a hole and a dam. But Grandpa remembered that at the time of Daniel, there was one. So whoever built this map, the La Rochefoucauld map, and you see me coming, this was drawn before we forgot about it, when those things were still existed. Uh, this was engineered, the La Rochefoucauld map, by somebody who knew that at the time of the construction of all this, 17, 1600, there was a dam and there was a water pool of fresh water that was used later by the McInnes family, as well as the others, in order to get fresh water for the cattle, for the cabbage, for the humans. And this don't exist anymore. Um, maybe it's underground, underneath the ground. We tend to think with Michael that all these features are underground or hidden or disappeared nowadays. And that's two features we're never been able to status on with Michael. 
Where, where is the basin? How do you calculate it? What's the coordinate? We, we don't have it. We never understood if it was underground, if it was dealing with La Hampe, like a tank of water to maintain pressure. That's what we thought with the dam. It could just be this dam and this hole. Or the Mackinnis family doesn't remember very well. And grandpa's talking about his grandfather to the daughter and making it up maybe or not or whatever. I don't know. But if we take for granted why the Mackinnis story is, here is our basin and here is our barrage described east of their cabin, full east on the North Shore. That's exactly where it points. Voila. <laughs> 35 minutes later, uh, I hope this was interesting to you. It took me a long time to uh, deep dive into each family genealogy, who was married with who. The, the two most interesting things of this video, there was a lot of people living on the island when the money pit was supposedly discovered in 1795. I never questioned 1795 before. I'm starting to, because we don't have much reference except storytelling. And the first reference is 1856. And the fact that John bought this thing in 79 on the 26th of June is kind of problematic, I think. And the second thing is, it seems if we agree and, and, and if we accept the McInnes family event um, telling about grandfather when asked, how did they survive on this island without fresh water? They say, don't worry, when Daniel and Mary, Barbara, moved in, there was water, of course. And there was a pool of fresh water and a dam. It could solve the cabbage problem. It would solve the La Rochefoucauld to Le Bassin Le Barrage instruction problem. And I don't know, maybe, it's, maybe it was there. Maybe it's still underneath. And maybe something is underneath and could be dug up. I don't know. And we don't know the purpose of this, the function in the system. But somebody took the time to not only draw it, but is the base for Ian here, our little Ian that's putting his head in that hole. Thank you very much for watching the show. I'm great enjoyment broadcasting it and shooting it. Hope to talk to you soon and see you soon uh, on John's show, or you can leave a comment, of course. And um, I'll talk to you soon and see you soon for more videos. Bye-bye.